You know, one thing is for sure, gearheads come in all shapes and sizes, and so do their projects. Cars, trucks, motorcycles, you name it. If it's mechanical, most gearheads are gonna be into it. But in spite of all this diversity, it's still possible to get into a rut in your way of thinking. In other words, when somebody says hot rod, you think of a certain thing. When somebody says off-roader, an image comes to your mind. When somebody says airplane, you think of a certain thing. But is it possible for an airplane to be a hot rod? Is there a flying equivalent of a 32 Ford? And if there was, is it something that you could buy and own and afford to have? Well, if you look back in history, you're gonna find that there is an airplane that's very similar to something like this. You know, in the world of airplanes, there was a time when they all had two wings on them. But of course, progress marched forward, and we ended up with the modern single-wing monoplane. But what airplane helped make that transition? Well, a lot of people recognize the Stearman PT-17 as one of the main planes to help do that. Matter of fact, this is the plane that most of our pilots learned to fly in in World War II before they took on the controls of a P-40 or a P-51. Of course, you're probably thinking that it would be impossible to own a Stearman today because they were built way back in the day, and if you could find one, they would cost a fortune. But that's not necessarily the case because there's still guys building and restoring these things. I'd say my favorite airplane would, would be this airplane. And, and obviously because I can do anything I want with it, it's aerobatic uh, certified and very seldom does it come back without being upside down a time or two. What's so great about this is I can tear this thing up today and tomorrow I'll go out and fly it. You get to be like a race car driver gets to build his own race car. The first thing that grabs you about a vintage biplane is the lightweight design. I mean, the structure is nothing more than a bunch of tubing that forms the inner framework. The controls have simple pivot points and basic cables that run from the stick and pedals to the control surfaces. This is about as high tech as a typical soapbox derby car. Now, if you think that's old school, take a look at this. The framework is covered in fabric, not metal. And to think that this is all that holds the plane in the air is a pretty sobering thought. So Steve, this is the fabric that you actually put on these airplanes? It is. Tell me about this stuff. It doesn't look very strong, man. Yeah. Well, that's what, what every, everything all airplanes are covered with use a Dacron, and it, um, it's got a warp. Instead of being 90 degrees, it's 45 degrees. You glue it on, or you pull it on, or you can sew it on. You put it like this and stretch it, yeah. and you glue it down, we'll say, to here to here. Yeah. And we're gonna take an iron, and that'll take all the wrinkles out and get a nice tension on it, bring it up to about so 300 shrink degrees. shrink when it, you iron it? Kind of like the old monocoat that you put on the radio controller. That's airplane. exactly what it is. <laughs> We're not talking high tech. <laughs> so how strong is it? I mean, if you step on it, will you go through it or will you hold your weight? I'll hold your weight. Now, the only thing that's really bad about it are high heels, people drinking uh, cigarettes. Or people in high heels that are drinking with cigarettes. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> or somebody with a, a pocket knife. Yeah, that's been drinking with high heels. And it's infinitely repairable. Of course, once you get the plane covered and painted, it is surprising how tough that fabric is. However, the true simplicity of a vintage biplane becomes very apparent inside the cockpit with the simple stick and rudder controls. By simply pulling the stick forward or back or side to side, you control the ailerons and the elevator. The pedals on the floor control the rudder, and the seat of your pants is what decides yeah, how much stick and rudder you use. Boy, that stick is light. Wow. The nature of tail draggers uh, and biplanes is they have some bad landing characteristics. This was the first airplane everybody flew, and it washed a lot of people out, and that's a shame because a lot of good pilots never made it. And it all had to do with the goofy landing gear being narrow in the tail. Of course, the key to any hot rod is to have a big engine thumping out front. 
and the Stearman does have that. A seven cylinder radio kicks out about 220 horsepower and allows the plane to fly at a blistering 90 miles an hour. But it's not the speed that's important here, it's the sound. Man, if you like Harleys, you're gonna love this thing. When Stacy David makes house calls in the big Gears Nation truck, it makes for some pretty special moments. But if they can't come to your garage, the next best thing to do is check out the stuff they have online to help you out. Things like DVDs, wiring and build books, apparel and fender covers are just some of the things you'll find to help you with your project or make a great gift for that certain car nut in your life. If you're ready to get out there, build something, and then go smoke the tires on it, StacyDavid.com can help you do that. Hey, welcome back to Gears, where today we're taking a look at one of the coolest hot rods ever built, the Stearman PT-17 biplane. <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you start protesting and saying, man, that's not a hot rod, let's take a look at its credentials. No fenders. Check. A big thumping engine out front. Check. A little tiny windshield. Check. An open air cockpit and a rumble seat. Check and check. Matter of fact, the only real difference between this and a Stearman is that one of them is supposed to leave the ground. Once you leave the ground, the crudeness of this kind of aircraft is the magic of it. As we said before, a stick controls ailerons and elevator, and pedals control the rudder. Of course, gauges monitor the engine vitals and things like altitude and airspeed, but not near as well as the sound in your ears, the feel in your gut, and the wind in your face. The airspeed is not much, about 90 miles an hour but the incredible maneuverability of the Stearman is what has made it a favorite of prop dusters and acrobatic stunt flyers for years. And this is where the magic and the legend of a biplane starts to take over. Suddenly, the seemingly innocent camera crew in the chase plane doesn't seem so innocent at all. It has somehow multiplied into enemy planes that now drop menacingly out of the sky, trying to cut you down deep behind enemy lines. You take evasive maneuvers and reach for your guns and take the battle back to them. As the fight rages on, your confidence grows because you know you have the superior skills and the superior plane. And slowly, the enemy begins to drop back one by one to your relentless onslaught. Then, in a lull in the battle, you see him, the Red Baron. Like a big red target floating in the sky, he beckons you and taunts you to try your luck. Of course, you can't resist. Suddenly, you're swarmed again in battle, and while you're busy, the Baron makes his move. Before you know it, you find yourself going down, down, down in a trail of smoke and fire. Curse you, Red Baron! Uh. 
And that's when you realize that flying in a Stearman with the rumble of the engine in your ears and the smell of the oil in your nostrils and the wind whipping at your face can make you imagine some pretty strange things when you're in the air. But it's something that every gearhead should experience at least once in their life. The best part is you can experience a Stearman yourself because there's a lot of guys like Steve out there that would love to help you build and fly your own airplane. And just think of it, if you had your own, you could challenge the Red Baron any time you wanted to. Ah! If you've got a cool project and would like to show millions of other gearheads what you're working on, you need to join Gears Nation. This is a free, interactive online community of auto enthusiasts that will allow you to learn from, share with, and encourage others, and at the same time, show off your project. There are also premium memberships available for access to special merchandise and the entire Gears catalog. If you're into mechanical things, you're welcome on Gears Nation. And who knows, you might even see your project on TV. You know, one thing that we try to do on Gears is cover all aspects of the gearhead world, from hardcore fabrication projects that take special tools to simple things that just about anybody can do on their daily driver. And right now, we're going to deal with a problem that a lot of people have been having with late model cars and trucks. Now, there was a time not too long ago when the headlights and taillights on your vehicle actually had a glass lens in front of them. And about the only way to tear those up was to break them. Of course, if they got nasty or dirty, all you had to do was wipe them down at the car wash and they were good as new. Well, that's not the case with new cars and trucks because they have a plastic lens over the headlights and taillights. And that plastic doesn't do well over time. It gets scratched, it gets hazy, and the coating that's over it starts to turn yellow until you've got some headlights that are about as effective as some candles in the front of your vehicle. Not a safe situation. Now, you can go down and buy yourself some new lights, and that doesn't seem like a real smart thing to do. When those still work, these are expensive, and the problem is not in the light, it's in the lens. So, we're gonna show you how to bring that back to life and save yourself some money at the same time. Okay, the first thing that you have to realize is that if your plastic lenses are in this bad of shape, there is no cleaner, no polish, no miracle goo that's gonna take that off of there. You're gonna to have to finesse it off like you would a paint job. Now, there are companies out there like Meguiar's and Mother's and Metal Armor, and they make kits to help you do this. But whether you buy one of the kits or you put one together yourself, the steps are the same. Here's how to do it. The first step is to wet sand the surface to remove the scratches and damage from the lens. Now the amount of damage is going to determine the grit that you use. We're starting with a thousand grit paper. Now as with any wet sanding, the key is to keep plenty of water moving to lubricate the paper and help it cut without clogging up. Once that's done, we'll move up to 1500 and then 2000 grit paper to get the sanding scratches down to something that we can buff out. Now, as you can see, we're using a backing pad under the paper so we get a nice, even surface without putting any waves in it. Now, at this point, you're probably looking at your lens going, oh man, I've really screwed it up. It's worse than it was before. That's all right, it's gonna start getting better because now we're gonna start hitting it with a light buffing compound and get rid of those scratches. And you can do this by hand, or you can put a buffing pad into a variable speed drill and power it off and it'll make it a lot quicker. But if you do the power route, make sure that you remember that the plastic is soft and it's easy to melt. So you need to go slow and use a light pressure or you will screw it up. It's starting to look better, but there's still some fine scratches in it. So from here, we're gonna move on to the polishing step Put on a softer pad and buff the lens with a final polish just like you would do a paint job. <laughs> I 
<laughs> and when you wipe off the polish, you might be surprised what you see. But we're not done yet. There's one last step, and that's to put on a wax or a glaze to not only give us the final shine, but to protect that plastic so we don't have to do this again in six months. And there you go. Quite a difference from what we started out with. And all it's gonna take you to do this is a little bit of spare time and a few bucks, and you will have headlights that are crystal clear and look brand new. Even lights like these that have almost 200,000 miles on them. But the real value of this is gonna come when you turn these lights on at night and you can actually see where you're going. If you're itching to get out and do something with your car or truck, fire it up and bring your family to one of the Gears Autoramas. There'll be cool vehicles, a silent auction, giveaways, and of course, a tour of the amazing gear shop with Stacy as he shares what goes on behind the scenes. You'll even get a chance to talk to him about what you're working on. So saddle up and put the pedal down to Nashville, Tennessee and the Gears Autorama. For dates, times, and registration, go to the events page at stacydavid.com. Now, Quick Tip, brought to you by E3 Spark Plugs, born to burn. If you've ever had to pour paint out of a can, well, you've had to deal with the frustration of the paint that gets caught in the groove at the top of the can. Now, you can try to wipe it out, you can try to blow it out of there, but invariably, when you put the lid back on and tap it with a hammer, that's what happens all down the side of the can and usually all over you. Fortunately, there is a solution to this problem. All you have to do is take a nail or a punch and punch some holes in the bottom of the groove at the top of the can. Then when you pour out your paint, all the paint that gets trapped in that groove will naturally drain back into the can through the holes that you punched. Now, I know you're thinking, well, that's gonna dry out my paint though. No, the lid still seals in such a way, once you tap it down on there, that it's gonna be airtight and it will not dry out your material. This is such a simple solution to this problem, it's hard to believe that these cans don't come with drain holes in them, but that's what quick tips are for. If you'd like to learn more tips that will make your life easier in the shop, check out the tips page on the website. Exhaust Tips, brought to you by Heartthrob Exhaust, where technology and craftsmanship come together. When you're laying out an exhaust system, most people spend a lot of time and money picking the right muffler and the right tips and the catalytic converter and all that stuff. And that's important. But just as important is how it all goes together. And I'm not just talking about if it fits or if it leaks or not. No, I'm also talking about is it serviceable and can you replace these parts when they go bad? And the piece that makes that possible is the exhaust clamp. Now, for years, this has been the type of clamp normally associated with exhaust. And you would take two pieces of pipe, put them together in a lap joint, and then take the clamp, put it over the top, and bolt it on underneath. Now, this will hold two pieces of pipe together, but it's got some drawbacks. Number one, they're prone to leaking. Number two, once you crank that down, you're gonna distort the pipe, and they're never gonna come apart. And you end up with something like this. Now, can you imagine trying to get that apart? Now, what you do is end up cutting the pipe and destroying the joint. Then, along came the band clamp, and this is much better. Now, what you've got here is just a band of stainless steel. You can get them with a step like this for going over a lap joint, or you can get it straight for going over a butt joint. And basically what you do when you tighten this thing down, it holds the pipes together and keeps them from leaking, and it does not distort the pipe. So, a few years from now, you want to take the system apart, you unbolt this, everything comes apart. That is great. For the average hobbyist, this is the way to go. Now, the bad part is you can't get these at just any auto parts store, so you may have to order them ahead of time before you start working on the system. Now, another way to connect pipes together is to weld flanges in different areas on the pipe. 
Then to take it apart, all you have to do is just unbolt it. Now this is great if you're pulling off your system at the racetrack or if you're swapping components all the time. Something like this just makes it a lot easier. The drawback to this, obviously you have to be a welder and you have to be able to design and engineer your own system. Now, one of the newest ways that tubing is being clamped together is with what they call a ball socket like this. And what you've got is one piece of tubing that's got a ball stamped into it like this. The other side has a standard flare. And when they come together, they seal like crazy. You've got this clamp that's curved that pulls them together. And it is a leak-proof seal, comes apart easily, no gaskets. This is the way to go. The drawback to this is obviously you have to find a company like Heartthrob that can actually stamp these ends in the tubing. Then, of course, you have to build them into your system. So there's some work involved there. But hopefully, this gives you an idea of some of the choices that you've got when you start clamping your system together. You can go as sophisticated as you want or as simple as you want. It's up to you. You know, one of the first true freedoms you experience as a kid is that first bicycle. Man, it becomes your transportation to the world, or at least the local neighborhood. And in my neighborhood, man, we all had bikes. And we'd stick playing cards in the spokes, and we'd suck on black licorice, make it look like we were big biker dudes, and it was magic. But a bike wasn't just about transportation. No, it became an extension of your personality. And there were all kinds of bikes out there. There were 10 speeds, there were mountain bikes, there were stingrays, there were BMX bikes, and they all had their strengths and weaknesses. And that's where the idea for the story of the Purple Bicycle came from. Because just like a bike might wish it had the talents or skills of another bike, so do we sometimes overlook our God-given talents and wish we had somebody else's talents, skills, color, abilities, because they seem to be better than ours. It's a simple story. It's a simple lesson. but something we all need to be reminded of from time to time. What are you working on? Brought to you by Dake. If you have a dream, we have the tools. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Cindy Dayton, and she is from Sparks, Nevada. Now, her vehicle is a 1963 Ford Ranchero. Here's a shot of Cindy with the Ranchero at a car show. Now, you know that she didn't start out with a vehicle that looked that good. <laughs> oh, matter of fact, here is what it looked like. As you can see, it came with all the free junk in the back and the optional camper shell. <laughs> now, obviously, she had some big plans for this car, and that is where this guy comes in. This is Drake. This is her husband. Now, he's a professional body man, and so he decided to jump into this car and help Cindy out. So the first thing he did, check it out here, he put tubs in the bed, put in a new frame, a fuel cell, check out the custom exhaust system, the rear end, put in a front suspension, and then he went to the interior. You can see the seats are new, the dash is new, he's got a whole roll cage in this thing. He has done some serious work on this car. Then the motor was just an old beat up 289. They punched it to a 347 stroker, they put a stick in it, here's a shot of that. Now they've been working on this project for eight years and it's still not finished yet, but as you can see from this picture, it's finished enough to where it's running and driving to where they can take it out to shows and enjoy it. But the best part about this is, we have got a husband and wife team here that haven't killed each other, which that alone is worth the prize. So folks, we are gonna give you one of these Dake Arbor Presses so when you hit some pressing matters on this project, you got the tool to take care of it. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you want to get your project featured on the show, send some stuff in to the What Are You Working On part of the website. Let us know what you got. It doesn't have to be finished. It just has to be something that you're working on. And we'll see if we can get it on the air. All right, that takes care of it for today. It is time for you to get out there and start working on something. We'll see you next week.